Okay, so we have 15 minutes. I'm going to just do some stuff in 10 minutes, and then I want to reserve the last, uh, maybe even five minutes, the last seven or so for questions. I'm always dedicated to get people out on time. Um, this stuff is just kind of fun. Um, I call it heretic, outlaw, husband, and father. He's a heretic by, of course, the church's view. He's an outlaw after the diet of worms. Um, anyone could kill him, and it would be appropriate, so he felt like he's going to die at any moment. Um, Katerina Van Boer, by all means, is a very interesting figure. This is who he ends up marrying, and my daughter, Damaris, actually just got, that's one reason I invited her to come with me tonight. She did a little homeschool presentation with our co-op where they all picked a historical figure, and she got placed with Katerina Van Boer. So it was really cool. So we've done a little Katerina Van Boer study in our home, she and I. We always write the reports together. So I got to learn a lot about this outstanding woman who I, would have, I just didn't know anything about. Um, at six years old, she's abandoned into a nunnery. So interesting. Now we think of that now as orphaned, but in that day it was like, well, you just give your daughter to be a nun. It's like the best thing for her. But you also think, wow, what trauma for a six year old to have to experience. I mean, my sons have both experienced that. Was she five? Sorry, see, I have my expert on the front row to help me with this stuff. Are you sure? I thought you said six. Anyway, okay, five years old. Yeah, that's, that's traumatic for a child, right? My sons have experienced such kinds of things, at least from extended family and death of family to be to be turned over, and whether, even though it's to the church, is still what it is. Um, she and her and other nuns start to read Luther, start to become convinced that Luther's right, and they want out. Now, to abandon the, the monastery or the cloisters, you could be killed. So it was tricky to get out, right? As they didn't want just kind of the floodgates open and everyone running away. So they write, she writes a letter to Luther, a very bold move, and saying there's a group of us that we, no long, we believe you now, but we're kind of caught here. Can you help us? And Luther works with this kind of um, shady fellow who's actually kind of a smuggler. Now, one of the things he's smuggling is Lutheran writings everywhere, but he's, I get the sense he may be smuggling other things as well. And he delivers fish to this cloisters every now and then. And so one night, uh, was it Christmas night or something like that? Yeah. Easter, okay. One night in Easter, he brings a, a um, wagon full of empty fish barrels, hides the nuns in the fish barrels, closes them up, rides out, straight to Wittenberg, and these smelly nuns all jump out of fish barrels, and now they're Martin Luther's problem. Um, he arranged for it, so he was happy with it, and Luther becomes, it's hysterical, he becomes basically in charge of marrying all these women off, and he starts writing letters to all of his friends saying, hey, we've got all of these nuns, and they're welcome to be married, so come, pick a nun, you can marry it, and, it's, and he really is, he's, and at one point someone says, why don't you take a wife? And he says, well, right now I have three, because he had three that he hadn't married off yet, so he's like, you know, I don't need one, I've got three, I have to deal with all three of these, but his primary reason for never marrying was, well, I'm going to be dead soon, they're going to kill me and I just don't want to leave a widow. So of the 12, this, is, this isn't really the romantic fairy tale that we all would love to hear, uh, only one's left, Katerina Van Bora. And she, he tries to arrange a marriage for her, and it falls apart because this guy's parents aren't that pumped about him marrying an ex-nun. And she just kind of, she's kind of an interesting personality. I think not many people could have been married to Luther. Uh, Luther, Bachelor Luther one time slept in the same sheets without changing them for two years. That just gives you an example of Eight? I read two today. Okay, eight years. So that's my, my daughter is an expert. Somewhere between two and eight. What? It was hay. Hay. Oh, slept on hay. Well, yeah, that's what bed would have been, the sheets and the bed and everything else. So um, she says, well, since that one fell apart, here's the only two people I'll marry. You, Dr. Luther, he was 42 at the time and she was 24. 26. 26. <laughs> you want to just get up and do this? I'll just put it on your face. I was close. Enough. Anyway, okay. Um, she says, I'll either marry you or you. The other guy was like, I think, a 50-year-old confirmed bachelor. He did not want to get married. I, think she, I actually think she was just kind of saying, eh, I just, if I'm going to get married, I just want to marry Luther. And so he kind of marries her, and it's so funny. I think I put it in there. His per, his, the reason he marries her, don't I have it in here, is to rile the Pope. He thinks, what will get the Pope better than me marrying this nun? That's why I'm going to marry her. Like I said, it's not kind of let's all, we all love each other so much. We're just, he basically says, it would be good for me to get married because that would really prove that this two callings thing doesn't work. Melanchthon actually didn't think he should get married. He, thought it, he, he didn't think it was a good idea. But Luther says, oh, what a better way to prove that this whole two ways of life has crumbled than for Luther to get married and establish this is what a pastor's home looks like. But the beautiful part about it is, so even though their marriage is kind of almost just created by this sort of circumstance, 
and by the end of his life, he's grown to love this woman, and he appreciates her so greatly. They have six children together. One dies as a child. Uh, one of his daughters dies as a 14-year-old in his arms. It's a heartbreaking story. It almost caused him to lose his faith for a couple of months, and his wife actually encouraged him through that to come out. I read that part just this week and was just weeping to think of losing a 14-year-old daughter um, and, and, and his faith kind of bringing him through. Um, their life, they lived in this old Augustinian, so somehow, I mean, this is interesting, isn't it? He no longer has the church to support him. So all of a sudden, Supporting his family is important, and he doesn't really know how he's going to do it, right? It's not quite like this where people, the church isn't quite established to the point that people are giving and offering tithes and offerings, and so he's not really sure how he's going to support his family, and at one point he buys leatherworking goods and brings them into his home so he could learn the trade of leatherworking, which I think is pretty cool. Right? He has such a high view, now he doesn't ever have to do it, actually, and he probably wouldn't, who knows if he'd have been any good at it. But what ends up happening is some of the wealthy people say, well, we want, we want Dr. Luther to keep doing what Dr. Luther's doing. We need him to keep writing. So they start, so they, they buy the old Augustinian cloister, and they put him up in that. And by all accounts, uh, when you read about their home life, even with their six kids, they had all these little rooms that they would, they would that's one of the ways they made money, is they would lease them, uh, lease them out to students of Luther's. And so they had students around all the time, male students, they had all their kids around all the time. And it really kind of feels like a frat house where Katarina Van Bora is like kind of the, the, the frat mom, right? That's just, that's the sense that I get. Because that's where the table talks come from, is that every single meal, the students were so eager to get every single ounce out of Luther that they could get, that they would not eat and they'd just be writing the whole time and asking him questions. And at one point, and this is, I, their, their, their relationship's really fun. At one point, she says, why don't you stop answering questions and start eating food or something like that? And he said something like, oh, if only women would be quiet like in the old days or something like that. And they kind of had one of these sorts of German, crass relationships that was fun. But he honored his wife really well. He actually called her Lord Katie because she was the Lord of his manor. Um, he would write her and call her all kinds of, he called her, he called her the morning star of the Reformation because she woke so early. She would brew beer and take care of chickens. And I mean, there's just so many different things. They actually had land outside of town that she would go out to and farm for like three days in a row and then come back and prepare all the meals. So you're talking about this woman worked incredibly hard and she was married to a fairly difficult man, um, to say the least. Um, then he had children. Now, I'm just going to read this, and then I want to I make some other points. I just, my wife and I found this whenever you were born, actually. We were living overseas um, when Damaris was born, and it was a hard time because we were living in Oxford in the United Kingdom at the time, and Damaris was born in December. Well, in Oxford in December, first of all, we're thousands of miles away from family, and in Oxford in December, it gets light at about 10 in the morning and gets dark at 3 in the afternoon. So if you're already going to be struggling with baby blues and depression, and then you live in this like dark, desolate place, and you have no family around anywhere at all, my wife uh, understandably went through a dark time. And this actually really helped her early on, Luther's crazy writings about um, children. And so I love this. This, this. And this is his vocation stuff applied. I'm just going to read this whole thing. That's why I gave it to you. Um, Sometimes I do a Lutheran impersonation while I read this, but I'll try not to, but it'll probably start coming out. Now observe that when the clever harlot, our natural reason, so when our natural reason looks at married life, she turns up her nose. So this is what natural reason would say about being married. Oh, alas, must I rock the baby, wash its diapers, make its bed, smell its stench, stay up nights with it, take care of it when it cries, heal its rashes and sores, and on top of that, care for my wife, provide for her, labor at my trade, take care of this and take care of that, do this and that, endure this and that, and whatever else of bitterness and drudgery of married life involved. That's a really positive view of marriage, isn't it? What should I make such a prisoner of myself? Oh, you poor, wretched fellow. Have you taken a wife? Fie, fie upon your wretchedness and bitterness. It is better to remain free and lead a peaceful, carefree life. I would become a priest or a nun or compel my children to do likewise. He's actually saying natural reason would tell us to never get married because there's all this negative stuff that comes along with this marriage. Now he's going to turn it in a beautiful way. What then does the Christian faith say to this? It opens its eyes. It looks upon all these insignificant, distasteful, and despised duties in the Spirit and is aware that they are all adorned with divine approval as with the costliest gold and jewels. It says, O God, because I am certain that Thou hast created me as a man and hast from my body begotten this child, I also know for certainty that it meets with Thy perfect pleasure. 
I confess to thee that I am not worthy to rock this little baby or wash its diapers or to be entrusted with the care of the child and its mother. How is it that I, without any merit, have come to this distinction of being certain that I am serving thy, your creature, and your most precious will? Oh, how gladly will I do it, though the duty should be even more insignificant and despised. Neither should frost, nor heat, nor drudgery, nor labor, nor distress dissuade me, for I am certain that this is pleasing in your sight. That's beautiful. I love that. All right, I, I got less time to land the plane than I thought. Let me just, I can't, we can't talk about Luther, we can't talk about anyone historically that's a human without mentioning their weaknesses. And the peasants' war is one that's always brought up. Basically, he told the princes, it's okay to kill the peasants and put them under submission. And basically, that's exactly what the princes did. He was very crass and rude. I think that was something that the Holy Spirit, he was, he was, I think he kind of wore it as a badge of honor, and I don't think it was good for him. I don't think he fell underneath the, the Holy Spirit's leaning in that. He might have always been a little bit crasser and cruder. Um, he did say some anti-Semitic things that obviously gets picked up later on in German Christianity. I don't think quite in the way he intended for it to, but it did. And the one that shocked me this week, I just learned, is that this guy named Prince Philip actually requests of Melanchthon and Luther the permission to marry a second wife, and essentially Luther grants him the permission to do it. That was a new one for me. Uh, it's a really, it's an interesting story. There's actually a really interesting article that explains it really, really well. If you're, if you're really interested in that particular part, it's written by, and, and the Catholics, of course, love that one because they love marriage. And so Luther, of course, is a heretic because he permits this. Um, and I wish I had more time to do this and I've not managed my time as well as I wanted to because we've had some fun. But I want to just say some things to how do we land this into our context. And I actually think it's already been happening. Um, but we're surrounded by people that are trapped by sin, right? We're trapped often by our sin. And, and, and so whether it's in Orange County or wherever you're living, there are people that are struggling that same struggle that Luther was struggling before he came to Romans 1.17. Um, I actually have an article here by a woman who was actually trapped in the Church of Latter-day Saints. And her, her story out, it's actually from Christianity Today, was that she watched the movie Luther and she recognized, well, the kind of church that Luther was up against is very much like the church that's telling me that I have to interpret the Bible in this kind of a way. And basically through this new media film comes to start to actually start to read the Bible in, a non -trans in, a tr in, in other translations, the New Testament, and comes to find through the sufficiency of the Scriptures, Jesus. And that's the second thing. I, just, I think that we see such a great emphasis on the sufficiency of Scripture from Luther that not only do people need the gospel, this, that's what they need. They don't need our podcast of our favorite pastor. That could be useful, right? They don't need all the other things that we might try to fill them. What they need is the gospel that comes from the word of God. And they don't need going to boyfriends and girlfriends and husbands and wives. The very best thing when we go to fellow Christians and small groups is what? If we're all pointing ourselves back to scripture, that's what we need because that's the only thing that's sufficient for that. And I think we can get that from Luther's life. And of course, the legitimacy of all calls, I think we've just talked about that really well. What people really need is justification by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And we're surrounded by a bunch of people that think they need anything and everything other than just that. And part of it is being winsome and fun and attractive and compelling and trying to say, this is what you need. This is what you need. You need the grace that comes through the Lord Jesus Christ. You might not even think you need it. You might think you're doing just fine. But what you need comes from the gospel alone.